say the one, but okay. <laughs> Hello, my name is Mark Skinner. I'm here with Kenneth Nelson and Gregory Clayhorn. We are three black Pratt graduates. We all went to Pratt Institute and we were all photo majors. And these are a series of conversations that we're having about photography, uh, particularly the the way we have uh, photographed and some of the insights that we've gained over the years. And uh, tonight we're going to be talking about the our favorite, excuse me, our favorite quality of light. And uh, it's a very loose conversation and it isn't rehearsed. So uh, I'm going to let uh, Ken start. Okay, cool. So I'll begin to share my screen. I hope I'm going to share it. All right, okay. You got the desktop there. You should see my screen. And I will... Are you able to see this image up here? Yes, yes, we a are. Man, man holding a tray of... Uh, what is that? Man, Players this man or? holding a tray of cannolis. Cannoli! Uh, so, yeah. So this one's at the uh, San Gen Feast of San Gennaro, but uh, this is definitely one of my favorite qualities of light. And as you can see, it's lit by the sun. <laughs> okay, And on a clear day, you could see forever and ever. And on a clear day, you get these amazing uh, Hi, quality of light. Yes. And it's uh, Good. from Purpose Church. Oh, hello. Is there anybody else that's with you? No, not today. Oh. Enjoy. God bless. Thank you. God bless. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Look, I got lunch. <laughs> okay. All right. So this is direct light from the sun, and this is a September lighting, and it is afternoon lighting. And so in September, the sun is starting to actually go down, so it's lower in the horizon line. And uh, this is definitely my favorite type of light: direct sunlight, not filtered through any clouds or any sh any shadows and not reflected off of any uh, surfaces at this point. Although in some cases when light gets reflected, when the sunlight gets reflected off of uh, surfaces such as glass or mirrors, it, it creates an interesting light source and an interesting lighting. But in this particular instance, that's not happening. Uh, again, direct lighting, uh, So just you'll just see that things just pop and contrast just exist. And that's one of the things I love about direct lighting is that as long as there's um, whatever surrounding it, if it's um, if part of it is in the shadow and part of the uh, your scene is in the it is the sunlight, it creates some amazing drama. So if you look at the right side of this image, it's in the dark, and if you look on the left side of the image, it's it's mainly in the light and with some dark uh, spots in it. But for the most part, the light just makes it the dark. The more dark it is, the smaller the amount of light it is, tends to make it pop. Uh, again, another one. Oh, dark it is. And this oh, one is wait, even. Wait, 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 wait. The more dark it is, what? The, you lost the me on that one. When you have, right, contrast, that's basically what I'm getting about. Oh, okay. More contrast. Okay. You get better contrast with direct light than you do with diffused light. Standard uh, practice in photography. And okay. this one's another case where it's direct sunlight. Um, and the good thing about it is that this one has a, a lot of dark in the background and it just makes his face come off the uh, the surface of this image so well. And of course, uh, with the expression of the image, it's just it just sings to me. Uh, again, look at the hard light. It's it's not too dark. So you can you have a little bit of uh, control over the shadows, at least uh, close up in the sunlight where in the background where the shadows are, uh, there's not that much detail. Uh, Here's another one, a uh, very contrasty image, but again, direct sunlight. Uh, this is a still shot or a street shot with no people in it. And uh, I was intrigued by, I was walking in, um, uh, where's this, uh, oh, Fort Green or Wimsburg, Brooklyn. Uh, no, actually Navy Yard in Brooklyn. And this uh, just appeared in front of me and I was like, wow, this light is amazing. And so I just had to capture this. And it just intrigues me to know when with the sharp edges and things of that nature and with using the light, the light coming from the the right, upper right, um, just to me, it just sings. And the last one I'll share no, with no you. No people, is, but the evidence of people. That's a that's a great uh, urban scape there, Ken. Yeah, I like that I, a lot. I, yeah, it's an it's a yeah, I, I really like it. And of course, I mean, I'm I'm into um, uh, what do you call this? Uh, this is an industrial zone, so I love uh, urban exploration. I think the term that they're using now to to do things. And so, anytime I walk in industrial zones, which is 
part of my makeup because in the neighborhoods that we grew up in or I grew up in, and Greg, you grew up in the same neighborhood, uh, is a lot of indust industry uh, on near the waterfront. And so that was sort of a little bit of a hangout. So that's uh, a sort of a, a keep, something that I always refer to when yeah. I go, which is- The Ritter Green Terminal, yeah, yeah. go ahead. Green Terminal, you know? <laughs> and the last one I'll share with you is uh, this one, which is, uh, this is a morning sunrise. And again, just uh, the sun did was you up. Say annoying sunrise. What did you say? No, I know <laughs> the morning sunrise. Morning sunrise. Okay, morning sunrise. good. This is uh, somewhere I I say just about maybe within forty minutes of sunrise, and uh, just the way the shadows are drawn. And I think again, this is September lighting, and and with uh, some of these are so I'll just go down the list. This is September lighting. And again, it, I, I, I don't think it's that much of a difference, to be honest with you. This is July lighting. Uh, this is July lighting. This is September lighting. Now, I don't, you, it's not, you're going to be able to tell, really, because depending on the time of day, the light could be, the, the angle of the sun towards where you are can basically be exactly at the same spot. Uh, so uh, direct lighting, what? sun. Different time of year. It comes from different directions. But it, well, wait, different I missed directions. That. Exactly. So the sun... Okay, so if you're going to shoot in July, the sun is at a certain angle at a certain time. Right. But you can also shoot in September where the sun can be at a similar angle at a different time, but it's at the oh, same time. Oh, I see angle. what you're saying. Okay, all right. So, yeah, so um, that's my, um, my favorite lighting. Well, I, I have to ask you a question. You, you have Me color too. and you have black and white images there. And you mentioned the fact that the lower the amount of light that's in the scene, the more it pops. Now, are you, in, in what way are you saying that it pops? Are you talking about counter to the light? Or in what are you talking about in terms of uh, contrast only? Or are you talking about uh, the negative oh. space? What, expound on what you mean by it, uh, the, it pops. The pops is, um, well, I, I'll show it to you again. I, I think, uh, let me just show the desktop again, share. And I'll just give an example of the this one uh i i think this this guy in the front although he's front and center he tends to and when i say pop it just like there's a three-dimensional uh sort of uh atmosphere to it he almost feels like he's stepping out of the image itself uh because the lighting tends to make that give that effect that he's actually doing that partially it's physics of uh, optics but uh, otherwise the light um, sort of enhances that ability to make the image look that way. Uh, and of course, in some ways, if you look at, I don't know if you'll see this, but this woman's face is is sort of three-dimensional in its own self, because, even though it's in shadow. You know, Which so woman? the combination of shadow and sunlight tends to make, can make things look like they're jumping off the page, giving you uh, a, something like a three-dimensional effect. And when the I say, to the right I, that's sort of what I mean. Um, well, the woman on the left side with the uh, straw hat. With the straw hat, okay. See, I, I, I think with this particular case, what's interesting is that the quality of the light, uh, I, don't, I don't really see the quality of light in this really making things pop uh, in terms of uh, different planes. I see the, the converging lines on the ground mm -hmm. uh, helping that happen. But in this particular photo, what stands out most to me is because he's wearing blue and he's wearing, and he's got a red bag in his hand. He's center framed and he is uh, wearing a short sleeve shirt and I guess sunglasses. He's, he, he seems like, uh, he seems like he's representing a particular type of America. And I, and I get that sense because the, the crosswalks are, painted in a way that are reminiscent of a, of a flag. Abbey Road. And, and he's, well, it's Abbey Road, but, but for me, it seems more like an Americanization of the Abbey Road image. Because when you, you know, the other people a little further back, and, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of societal constructs that one can overlay on that particular image, if you're imaginative enough. I mean, you can project onto, a, you know, the types of things I'm talking about, which is evidently what I've done. You mean but like it, Americana or something political? Well, like, social? like it, it makes it look like he's he's the American standing on this big giant American flag, and everyone else is uh, 
a, a, a second tier or a further back in, in society. You know, that, that's what I get from that particular image because he's wearing the blue and the red and the red part with that bag is so close to where the stripes are and the stripes are white. There's sort of that white, red, red white pattern. Yeah, red, you, you, red, white pants, blue shirt. Exactly. Square-jawed okay. square white American. Yes, and, and, and so, you know, everyone else does not seem as stereotypically uh, as stereotypical of the ill way we illustrate Americans in cinema. And, and, and so that's what I see. I know what you're saying about, uh, you know, the light makes it pop. The thing that pops most to me is that red bag. I don't think, the, I think without the red bag that that photo would not be as successful as it is. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, so was uh, was that uh, Ken's psyche valve for the week? Is, is, <laughs> no, no. I mean, I, I, you know, I, well, I mean, I, I agree that the contrast really gives you a, a starkness to the to the uh, uh, the draftsmanship that the that's going on. I, I like that, um, and I think that's a continuum that you're that you're you know you, you show in those in those those photographs. I mean, um, yeah, there's, there is a starkness. There's a, you know, it's a very similar, that's a recurring pattern. You know, you've got the stripes and then the stripes go into a, uh, a point of perspective in the center of the screen for those two particular images, just these two images that you've picked to group together. You know, there's a, there's a commonality. It looks like he's carrying a flag. Wait a minute. There is a pattern. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, a type of flag. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I I mean, I see cannolis in a row. So. Right, but but there's the the stripes, the cannolis are they're brown and 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 beige as opposed to red and white. They're and he's carrying and, and he's got and he's got a and he's wearing and, a Captain America t-shirt. Wait a yeah, minute. Yeah, exactly. There's a, there's a Yeah, there is a there's a recurring sensibility about you know these these folks that are in the in the foreground that are here in a uh, particular type of environment. Yeah. Okay, they're, they're so watching a lot of CNN, haven't you? It's okay, so no, no. It did, I'm just saying. I'm just saying what I read. Like I said, I, you can, one can project and overlay whatever they want, but I'm just pointing out that the that there's a lot of connectivity between you know a stripe pattern and a star on a blue field. On a principle, you know. Okay. I see that I'm hungry, and I see the, uh, a lot of food, and I'm, I want to eat one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my, my, my observation. Mark, were you done? You, you went away. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's good. You, you. I, I had a, uh, I was wondering if for you, like, in the, like, F-16 club, because it's f clear all the way to the, you know, from, from the, you know, from the fourth wall all the way into the distance. Was that intentional or using the light to just, because uh, I remember when I was shooting and I would have, I would set the camera on F-16 so I wouldn't have to look. I could just kind of compose and, you know, point and shoot. But uh, was that a conscious thing to use that quality of light so that you get like infinite depth of field? That's for me in, in regards to the, the images that I just showed? The images you showed, the cannoli, the depth. I know, I, I love uh, the San Gennaro Festival just because it's so well attended. Uh -huh. um, that one, the uh, the guy walking in the street, the uh, it could have been yeah, like a no. gap ad. Yeah. And, and, well, uh, no, the images here are actually um, shot at a shallow depth of focus. Um, no. so, yeah. This image is shot at about maybe 2.8, maybe f4. No, it is. How, how is that possible? Look at look at how far back the focus is. The f the focus is actually on the chest of the man in the front. No, but I mean, I, oh, I'm not doubting that. It's very the foreground is very much in focus. But I don't know. Maybe I got I got to get a bigger screen for my. Next, no, no, it's uh, the it's the, the wide week. angle. I mean, you know, it's the wide angle that. Yeah, but has the a depth, greater depth of field. The yeah. Depth of the focus is is yeah. is really deep. That um, did not sound like a photographer said that. No. But, okay. Um, so let me give you a frame of reference. The person that's closest to the camera is about yeah. a, no no more than a foot away from it. Okay. 
All right. And everything beyond that is um, basically maybe four feet and further away. Yeah, but look at how sharp that the, the people in the background are. You can make out faces. There's no blur. What is that? Bokeh? They're actually no blurry. Bokeh effect They're all. actually out of focus. <laughs> all right. Maybe because my screen is so well, small. I'll, I'll, I'll I mean, I guess, my, I guess, uh, I guess, I mean, I guess, I mean, what, what, screen. what, I, I guess without asking, like, you know, what gear are you using to accomplish this, you know, broad, you know, sweeping focus, uh, depth that you're you're getting i mean you're getting the guy's shoulder you're getting people in the back right you know what 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 is what tools do you use to to accomplish this this feat of focus i'm actually uh zone focusing so i'm zone focusing at uh, one meter or less actually in some cases it's three quarters of a meter and i'm waiting for something within that range to come in and so i'm usually um at an f-stop of f4 or, or lower. So I'm usually at an F, F4, 2.8, or 2. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I'm shooting like that, because I want to isolate the individuals that are within that frame at that, at that distance. So everything else beyond that goes out of focus. And in this particular instance, I saw this guy coming because he was coming from my right, and I actually took about three frames. And the first two frames are him coming in from my right, so I'm angling the camera in his direction. And as he's walking toward me, I'm slowly panning until he gets in front of me. And that's when I take this, ex to this shot, this exposure. And this is not cropped at all. So this is the full frame of the image. Uh, this is shot most likely with a 28 uh, at, uh, at f4, if not f2.8. I don't know. The people in the background are, no, not to take anything away from the shot. This is a great shot. I love the, the you know, the cluster of people, you know, the energy in the shot. And, you know, he's carrying like these, you know, delicacies of the, uh, oh, oh, well, uh, I enjoy that great deal. The, 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 the New York closeness of it and everything, but it's the, you know, the yeah. people in the background are so in, in focus. Well, in this small screen to me that it seems like your depth of field is really deep. Same yeah. thing with the uh, the guy crossing the street. The depth of field, you can see the buildings all the way up the all the way up the block. Yeah. And they, they look like they're in focus to me. You know. Yeah, they're not. I mean, this okay, one is well, shot, I, uh, I'll view them on a bigger screen next okay. time. Yeah, this is shot with a fifty millimeter lens, and it's probably shot at most likely f two or f two point eight, uh, really? because I, yeah, because. Okay. When I'm shooting in this this particular uh, subject type or this particular uh, genre or this particular um, project, which is uh, called crosswalking, and it's basically uh, centered around uh, people crossing the street at the crosswalk, and I usually um, zone focus to a sp preset distance at f2 or 2.8, and uh, I begin to take shots um, relative to who's walking in front of the camera. And uh, depending on their distance from the camera, at 2.8, they'll either be in focus or out. And for this particular instance, uh, the man who's actually closest to the camera is actually softly focused. The people who are actually in critical focus are the couple on the left side, the one with the straw hat, the man and the woman with the, the, woman with the straw hat and the cranberry colored bag walking into the field of view. They're actually in, in critical, they're in the best focus. The man with the sunglasses and the blue, he's actually soft. So, so to do this type of street photography, someone really has to know what the limitations or the capabilities are of the equipment they're using. Absolutely. And again, it's about pre-visualizing uh, where you, what you want to happen, when you want things to happen, and if things should happen in that zone, then that's when you would take the exposure. If nothing happens in that zone that you feel warrants a photograph, then you're not going to take the shot. <clears throat> okay. Can we can we go to the photograph of the uh, Central Park the granary? Or, or, oh, no, I was going to say the granary. Oh. granary. This one? That, no, no, we'll start. We, we, we go there. I meant the granary, but... That's not the granary. Oh, well, well, uh, sorry, the industrial. You guys were talking oh, about the granary. The industrial, that one, yeah. All right, the industrial. Um, and now, how does this type of photo uh, relate to the type of street work you do uh, for you when you're when you're shooting this type of uh, image? 
actually what's interesting about this one is that the two images prior in color are shot with a different camera they're shot mm -hmm. digitally this actually was shot on film okay. and so, so when i shoot with a different camera my 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 observations and my intent are different uh, and so what I wind up doing is taking a little bit more time in what I'm photographing and executing it in a different, more methodical fashion than what I'm shooting on the street, shooting people, photographing people on the street. So this one I saw and I was around this, this, this happened, this is, uh, again, uh, I sh photographed about six or seven frames, uh, of a roll of 10 shots. Uh, in this on this sidewalk and I exposed about three of them in this particular with this particular point of view There were other things happening to my left that I was enjoying too and I didn't I don't have those images But this is the one this is the pick of the images for me that I that I decided to share I think it's one of the most successful of the other images that I did at that afternoon at that time and I, I was just so intrigued by um, the angles and the difference in textures and tones and foreground and background relationships. And in this particular instance, in this particular instance, I photographed at a, at a uh, smaller uh, f-stop. So I was probably f uh, photographing at maybe f my usual f-stop that I photograph with when I'm shooting film on this camera is f8. So it's most likely I shot this one at f8. Well, I'll buy that. Again, the depth, your depth of clarity is all the way edge to edge, man. So do you, do you categorize this image as a landscape, as an abstraction, or as both, or what? How do you, how, for, how, how is this to be, if I, you know, I hate to do this, but if you had to put an image like this in a genre for yourself, would you? And if you did, uh, what genre would you put this in for yourself? It's kind of interesting because what I have to do is when I scan these in, I have to tag them with metadata. And so when I tag them with metadata, I have to consider all the possibilities in which what how what this image would be described as. And so it I think some of the points of view are cityscape, abstract, okay, uh, textures and tones, um, z um, industrial zone because it has to do with that as well. Uh, and those are the key factors. So I would say that this is a cityscape. Uh, rather speaking than a landscape. Of, speaking of zones, you Ansel Adams would be proud. You've got every tone of film expressible in this image. Bravo. Oh, thank you for... Well, yeah, yeah. I, I was going to say, the, the shadows are nice and open, and it's, it's really wonderful. Yeah. The, um, yeah, the scan was a good scan, and just working the, the contrast to a level in which I was happy with it. Uh, because for the most part, when you're scanning things in, it scans a little bit flat, uh, just like you're, sometimes some people consider that a, digital's, a digital image is sort of flat when it comes out as a, uh, without any um, adjustments to it. And so you bring it into Lightroom and you just add some contrast to it to a level that for me uh, uh, keeps the highlights from blowing out or just going blown out in maybe small spaces within the frame and making sure that the shadows are deep and rich and uh, don't get uh, clogged up so you can see detail. So you have that, uh, that range of uh, delicious tonalities uh, for everyone to enjoy when they look at an image. Yeah, my eye it just keeps going like this around the image. It's like, ooh, ooh, wait, ooh, ooh. <laughs> 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 very cool, very cool image. Okay, guys. We've got a lot of time. We got a lot of time to do well, this. Okay. So uh, again, there's a there's a photograph of uh, of myself that I put in the uh, in our feed in our in our normal uh, posting area. Uh -huh. If you can if you can bring that up at some point, just let me know because um, that that really is indicative of the type of uh, it's representative of the type of uh, light that I I tend to like most. Okay. So, and I can't I can speak to it very very briefly, but it's. Yeah, it is a favorite quality of light. Okay, this there is the you image. go. That's it. Yeah, um, that particular image. What I like about it is that it is it, it replicates daylight through a window, and I like it's not daylight at all. It's a it's a it's a continuous light. It's LED, 
in a giant softbox, uh, and it's bounced off a couple of cards, and the shadows are open, there's a gray background, but that is actually my favorite type of light, my favorite quality of light, I should say. Um, I don't get a chance to photograph in that quality of light uh, as much, because the type of work I do tends to require light that's a little bit more glamorous uh, for the client, but um, that is my favorite quality, and sometimes I do get to 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 do that. So uh, maybe in a future show, I'll you know talk. To, you know, I'll, I'll show another example uh, when I get a little bit. Uh, what I would say say a better better samples for myself. Uh, that's really about it. It's just a. I just think it has a nice quality to it. And what? How would you? How did you get? what would you say your influences are in, in sort of gravitating to this type of light? Oh, definitely uh, Vermeer, I would say. It's, uh, uh, I would say Vermeer. I would say some of the paintings that, excuse me, some of the photographs uh, that I used to see in, uh, in Vogue magazine in the 80s and 90s, Harper's Bazaar in the 80s and 90s. Um, where it looked like a lot of the fashion work was done in a studio with huge windows. Um, I now know that a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of that was probably done with strobes off a flat or something like that, bounced off a flat. But uh, just a big flat light that replicates slightly overcast day, uh, brought like noon to 2 p.m., just, you know, flooding into the room in a soft, big, soft light. That is my favorite type of light. So, so, so wait, I'm sorry, I missed that, Ken. Sorry, Ken. So is this actual daylight or a soft box? It's, it's actually an LED. It's an LED light. So it's artificial it, light. It's artificial light. It's an LED light bulb that uh, is in the modeling uh, lamp socket of a strobe. And that strobe has a, a, a huge four foot, four half foot uh, soft box on it. And uh, the soft box is bouncing off a, uh, a couple of flats. And those flats are now bouncing uh, back into me. You can see on the upper left hand corner, that's basically where the light is, but it's feathered. And it's, uh, it's just a nice quality of light. So would you say that you love contrasty lighting as well? I mean, because when you think about Vermeer and you think about the classic of uh, photographers of the uh, black and white movie age, uh, they tended to be uh, dramatic in their lighting where it's uh, the shadows were very deep and the highlights were almost to a, could be a mid-tone to a, a near washout. Uh, would you say that uh, this actually may be would be actually should be slightly more contrastier in terms of the shadows for your taste, or is this um, just an example? Well, well, believe it or not, uh, there's a, there's a there was a photographer named Eve Arnold who was a Magnum photographer, and she got to do a lot of movie. She did movie sets and magazines and so forth. And one of the uh, one of the subjects that she had uh, the opportunity to photograph quite a bit was Marilyn Monroe, and she did a series of backstage photographs, not just Marilyn Monroe, but other cast members. And I really liked the fact that even though she was in the desert, she was able to get a, a type of softness and flatness with natural light in the desert that I really haven't seen replicated again until, uh, I think Herb Ritz, uh, does something like that. It's contrasty, but the tones are soaked right. And I think he used a big HMI light. I'm not sure exactly, but but he, it, you know, the the tones are so right that they they see, you know, there's a there's a flatness in there, you know, and uh, because because everyone gets the exposure right, and I I, I really like uh, how Eve Arnold covered uh, the Misfits. It's contrasty, but there's a lot of subtlety to the tones. You don't see. It, you know the, the 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 highlights aren't washed out, and the shadows aren't blocked up, and uh, even though it's done in broad you know broad daylight, there just seems to be a certain kind of flatness that comes through because uh, 
she was so technically proficient with the black and white film that she used and the and the in the printing that you don't you just don't see the contrast. I mean, anyone who's photographed in in broad daylight with black and white film, uh, one of the things you you notice immediately if you haven't exposed it properly and developed it properly and printed it properly is that everything does look just black and white with very few shades of gray in between. And I think what I like about this quality oh. of light... Hmm? I, go ahead, finish. No, I was going to say... Contrast. No, <laughs> contrast. Yeah, just black and white. It's just very contrasty. It, there don't seem to be as many shades of gray. I mean, Greg, you had mentioned earlier about the, the, the multiples of shades of gray that uh, Ken was able to get in that other photo uh, in uh, his photograph in the industrial photo. And I agree, it's just wonderful to do that. But you have to be a very good technician to know how to do that in black and white film. And uh, a lot of people aren't. And so with black and white film, well, it's exposure, it's development, it's printing. It's the entire process, right? I mean, am I wrong? I mean, it's exposed for the shadows, print for the highlights, that old... uh... Yeah, I mean, Ansel made three books: one on the camera, one on the negative, one on the print. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's an entire field of uh, technology that isn't used as much anymore, but it's certainly as uh, intricate as what goes on with digital. And I think you know those thousand shades of gray is what we are all kind of taught to look for. And I think the only difference here is that with this, I mean, if I converted this to a black and white image. There are probably a, a lot of shades of gray, but the only difference is is that you probably don't have uh, an absolute shadow area here. Maybe the glasses, but that's you know even that's got tone in it. You know maybe some of maybe my hair some of my hair is still black, but that's about it. Yeah. The, 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 go ahead, then. Sorry. Go ahead. I think if you if you remember the uh, characteristic curve of contrast, and you just yeah. take it and you I don't. <laughs> you don't. The characteristic curve, it could be straight, so it's linear, or it can be concave to the point where it just goes from white to dark really fast. <laughs> you know? Right, but, you, but you're also talking about what is it, a shoulder and a foot? In a... Yeah, shoulder and a foot. <laughs> yeah, shoulder and a foot. yeah, exactly. Right, right but, but with, with, with film, we didn't have that, right? We, did, we didn't have a shoulder and a foot. Basically, you just had a test strip, and uh, you found out how many tried to figure out how many shades of gray you could get into that test strip before you made a print yeah i mean you could have done the characteristic curve of the shoulder and foot with film but that's just a little bit more arduous of a task because that requires you to process and test and process and test and process and test and of course all lighting situations are not the same so therefore it's almost like uh you know you if you stick to a standard to try to get a specific uh characteristic curve uh, and a foot and a toe. I'm sorry, a foot. I think it's called a toe, right? It's a shoulder. Shol- a shoulder and a foot. And, a toe. and, and you, you, can, you can drop the second image of me there. Okay. Yeah. So, and yeah, with uh, processing and development, you could do that. Well, yeah, but it's also exposure. I mean, basically with black and white film, I mean, you know, was it rated at 400? But we, you know, we know it, it's not really 400. It's a, it's it's a little bit lower, so mm-hmm. you got to overexpose and underdevelop, and it's a it's a it's a it's a process. But right. anyway, what I was gonna say is my favorite type of light, my favorite quality of light, tends to be uh, a, a much softer, more ethereal, Art, you know, artificial uh, light. Artificial, even even daylight. I tend to like overcast days uh, a little bit more than broad sunlight. Uh, and I really do tend to like an overcast day acting like a softbox, you know, shooting through yeah. a window, not a window with a shade, but a, a like a like a, a, a clear, clean window. I, I think that's just some of the nicest light that you can get indoors. I think I just wonderful. And I, and I think about Vermeer because Vermeer usually painted with uh, uh, a lot of his paintings uh, had that window on the left. And everyone's yep. illuminated by that window on the left. And uh, I can't really, I mean, I was a, I'm a big fan of Degas also, but I can't really think of anyone else who really kind of drafts and utilizes that kind of quality of light without 
trying to add atmosphere uh, the way Rembrandt does. You know what I mean? <laughs> what are you? T- um, okay, one of the fun things about Vermeer, thank you, Pratt, but it was, I mean, the all the detail that he had in the room. You know, I mean, just the, the wall treatments, you know, the, the the people were always doing something, the textures. It wasn't just about the one, the, you know, natural light coming from one direction. No, no, no but that was, but, but Ken asked a specific question. He said, well, you know, what, you know, what kind of inspires this? And that, that's really the inspiration. Yeah, Vermeer had, he had drama, he had intrigue, he had, you know, all patterns, sorts of things. I didn't mean to cut Patterns and colors and yeah. Man, the subtleties in his images are just, you know, um, a little bit more than just, you know, like the girl with the pearl ink earring. One of the coolest things about that is that he had a, like a black background and she just pops, you know, like a like what I was going to say uh, with your um, the, that uh, that Americana guy crossing the street, Abbey Road. If your angle was a little different in that dark building, was right. Right, if he was right in front of yeah. that dark building, yeah, he would yes. have definitely popped forward. Yeah. But his placement with that dark building just behind him yes. did push him forward in the yes, in, you it know, did. You in, saw that, so yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I, yeah. I like playing with light and being that was go ahead, go, but seeing the light that, that's that's what I'm going to talk about in a minute, as soon as I, <laughs> but go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not, I'm done. I mean, I don't know, uh, Greg, Mark, are you are you you done? Yeah, yeah, I've, I've said what I've had to say. I mean, only, I only put had one image. Thanks, Ken, for posting that for us. Sure. So, Greg, hey, how do what, I get what, in what, on this? I want to. What is? Yeah. Do what is your and, and right. show out of the aisle? Stuff. Out of the aisle. So, uh, how do you? How, yeah. What is your? Uh, what is your favorite quality of light? Oh man, that's like you having a bunch of kids and trying to pick your favorite kid. That's not going to work. Not a good career move. Is it? You'd be on your deathbed, and you're like, I remember me? I'm the one you didn't like. I like all kinds of qualities of light. I can't see you. You got no picture up. Your camera's off, Mark. Anyway, I'm here. Um, how do we? Uh, I'm here. Uh, how do we? Uh, I want to, because I want to. I want to put my. Uh, who, who's the tech guy that I submit pictures to, so I can do the. <laughs> share the picture on the screen too because i don't care i'll just uh, just just, just post it there. just post it in our in our regular posting area and then and, and ken and can pull it up from there okay uh my favorite light is uh whatever light i happen to be working at you know there's some <sighs> some I, oh was that a cop out ken you didn't like that answer that was it? yeah that was that was deferring <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean it's hard because I like I like well okay if I had my brothers I'd, I'd shoot almost exclusively in early morning I love the magic hours on both sides I do I okay. I I, I, uh, I don't I don't uh, you know have any um, I make no qualms about that like where's my magic light uh, let's see magic light shot I really can't no of course I can't find any I had one. Um, hmm. See, I don't know. It, it, it's just tough. I, lo- I love studio light because studio has its own qualities and stuff. Uh, definitely, Mark, like Mark said, um, I like making some images uh, in natural light that looks like they could have been shot in studio for sure, you know, but um. Light is is all about um, okay. Probably like like this shot. Let me flip this around real quick. Say so like I love this image, the Santa Monica Pier, you know. But without really getting an idea, of, it's fuzzy. You have to you have to. Is it uh, fuzzy? Or wait, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it might be now? reading that as background. Yeah. Oh, or. Okay. All right, well, I can yeah, shut turn up, up your that. background. Um, uh, that one I can do. Oh, do, 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 do. that one I saw. There you go, and that enable background blur. So that's off now. So, right. uh, I guess what I'm trying to show you is that image. How's that? Is that better? Yeah, yes. very nice. Yep. All right, that's a, of course the world famous Santa Monica Pier. Do a little panorama, but the idea of um, 
getting that as a straight shot, it ain't going to happen because you got the sun right behind the sign. And I did a couple of tests of that, and I'm like, okay, that's not what I want. But, um, you know, you, you, you getting to know the light or getting to see the light and getting an idea, of, you know, like uh, Bart, both of you were talking about, is, you know, getting your exposure, you know, and knowing, knowing in your head what you wanted to do, what you want, what your end product is, you know, without going in. And uh, now I could have done this totally in Photoshop or Lightroom with one shot and then going in and highlighting and lassoing and bringing the sign forward and then darkening the sky so that it looks like, oh, hey, you got your exposure. No, I, uh, this was a straight shot. I knew that was gonna, so I exposed for the, uh, for the, uh, for the sign. And then in camera, I brought the sky down so that I could hold some of the sky color but also keep the, the thing. So um, being able to see the light is so important. Like like the shot with the, the industrial shot that you shot, Ken. I love all of the angles and everything's doing this. And then in addition to all the angles, you've got the shadows that the that the box the, the the structures are making, and they create their own world. So there's, there's this like depth in there that the light is doing. So you know that quality of light. You know, you gotta love it. So, um, being able to see the light—that's what I'm. I, 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 I'm really big on. So, if I had my druthers, you know, like, uh, and then street photography. I always had a thing for street photography. And, um, you know, seeing that 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 uh, photography is like a two-dimensional medium, unless you make it into a three-dimensional medium. Uh, either physically, you know, like a, those pop-up books or something like that. But to make a two-dimensional image three-dimensional mentally, visually, is a trick of life. You know, like, like uh, again, not to harp on that picture, but, you know, where the position, where you choose to position the, your subject, as opposed to, you know, the time of day where your light is uh, popping at it, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's really hard for me to pick, you know, favorite well, we're not going to hold you to it permanently no, okay. like right. no this is being recorded, you know, recorded, we're, not gonna, you know. we're not going to hold you to just seeing your golden hour shots and only your golden hour shots and only accept those but it's not but, a but, but 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 there are photographers who have made a point to do that i mean didn't joel meyerwitz have a series of street photos that were you know really about that quality of light just before the sun goes down those super long shadows and mm -hmm. how yeah. that how that affects the cross streets of manhattan for sure. Yeah, he did that, but only as a portion of the total amount of images he shot over his life, because right, he went right. through phases, right? Just like everybody goes through phases about what they're, what what intrigues them and what attracts them, and in terms of light, yeah. I, I twenty years ago, I I liked soft lighting. I liked overcast because I was shooting uh, color, and when I shoot color film, I love overcast lighting. Mm -hmm. You know. Because remember the history of color in, in overcast, uh, cloudy days or misty it days. Too it, well. just, it no, it made your it made your color pop. Right, because you you had more tonality. It was easier to bring the flat image more contrasting to darkroom. Well, in color, in terms of color alone, remember color. I think a Kodak color and some of the color films when very color, Kodak color. Right, your color was slightly your color was more enhanced. It's just like adding ten percent saturation just by shooting in, in in a in a sort of a misty sort of day, an overcast day rather than a bright sunlit day. Mm. Okay. That used to be a characteristic of some of the films when I was shooting. I you would notice that, and I think even in some cases when we were shooting, Chrome is right, different. Right, and, I was like, chrome, yeah, well, Chrome negative. because the Kodachrome was was all about getting Chrome was contrasty anyway. It was yeah, it was it was yeah. basically about getting primary colors right. correctly. Yeah, and it leaned a little yellow, but that's okay. <laughs> well, it was about getting the yellow, the blue, the red. I mean, basically, it was you know Koda, Koda, you know Kodachrome. A lot of it was about that, at least how they sold it. And then if you really knew what you were doing, you could expose it properly and get the tonality of the, the ASA 25 hey, you, film. You, you guys were the, the, the commercial guys. They, they, uh, Kodachrome was kind of... Kodachrome, which one? Okay, Kodachrome was notoriously yellow. Ektachrome was notoriously lean blue. Yes. And Fuji, if you wanted deep reds, you got Fuji. Fuji film. 
No, you guys didn't go about I think that. Fuji Color had a lot of green. Yes. Had a they did the green, greens and reds. It did lead toward the green. Red. Did the, the greens? Yeah, Fuji Fuji okay. tended to lead toward the green. Kodachrome toward the you know, toward the yellow, and it but it did great things for red. And um, okay. yeah, it did do red well. And ectochrome blue, and that's why I never liked. And of course, but the thing about it was that I think it, in the early days, Kodachrome was only available in '64 and '25. Right. And I, later on, well, they tried to well, develop 200. Well, not only that, Kodachrome had to be processed by Kodak or a Kodak affiliate. And yeah. ectochrome, they released that anywhere, and you didn't even have to use uh, Kodak chemistry. I mean, you right. could use Bessler chemistry. And so you had labs popping up all over Manhattan, particularly in the photo district. You know, that, right. was, a, that was a big deal. There must have been seven or eight labs just in the 20th Street and 5th Avenue area, you know. Yeah. And speaking of the just tonalities of film, I mean, they have a major impact on quality of light. So, you know, just imagine shooting a, a, a magic, a golden sunset, or, right? And you're shooting with ectochrome and it's not golden. It's more <laughs> muted green or something. So, you know, uh, what do you do when you try and, you know, if, if in the days when you're, if you're shooting film or you're shooting chrome, which film would you use to shoot the golden hour? I use Kodachrome. You use Kodachrome. Would you use Fuji? You, no, you well no, you know, use color chrome and then you then you, you bracket like like the man yeah. possessed is what you do. Yeah. <laughs> no, you, but basically you know you 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 know you 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 know your tools. You know what you know what you have to do to get the kind of exposure out of ASA twenty five slide film, and mm -hmm. uh, you know if you you know was it twenty. You know, you have to underexpose it a little bit to get get the saturation, or exactly, overexpose yeah. it to to get the open shadows. But you you have to know your materials yeah. and what what they do. Yeah, Mama, don't take my coat of chrome away. <laughs> Just don't do it. Uh -huh. Okay, back to this quality of light. Now I got to show you this one because that one I saw that in an urban setting, and I was like, wow. But the sun was. I mean, that's when the uh, the um, I saw it late in the day, and I knew the uh, you know the golden hour was not going to help that because there was a lot of shadows, and I was like, you know, I matched. I, what I tried to do was match the uh, match thematically, match the light to what I was shooting. Mm -hmm. You know, with all the colors, you know, all the colors were in the image in the painting, and um, and uh, how do you catch that? But with the flattest light you can do. So I came back like a day or two days later when the night, the sun was clear, no clouds, and I waited until it was as, you know, as flat as it could get. And, um, you know, this, this woman with their kid just happened to be, you know, with that $5 stroller. I mean, you know, it is what it is. I had one too. I'm not going to knock it. But um, matching the light to the, to the, thematically to the image that you're trying to shoot. It's kind of a challenge that I enjoy with, uh, you know, quality of light and matching the light indoor, outdoor, whatever. You know, I try to I try to do that. So um, I think it came off pretty well. It's, it, it's all about the, um, you know, the graffiti art, which was amazing. And the urban scene to that was just, you know, matching the light to the situation, you know. This is kind of like an abstract, and I would not have seen it if, uh, excuse me, if, uh, if, oh, come back the other way, if, um, you know, I didn't happen, happen upon it at the right time. So this is, uh, these are on my Zinfolio, thank you, Mark. This is also my Zinfolio website, gregclegg.com, gregclegg.com, gregclegg on photography. That blue center frame. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. You know, that was, it's an abstract, but um, it was, all right, I'm not going to tell you. What do you guys think of it? I'll leave it there. <laughs> you photographers. <laughs> I mean, we're looking at a screen, to a screen, okay, I'll just and we're looking at right, right. Okay, all right. So all I'm right. figuring shame it's... Shame me, shame me. Go ahead, shame me. Go ahead. No, something having to do with water. That, that would be my first thought. Yeah. It's very painterly. Yes, it looks uh, like kind of like one of those Japanese things of the wave, you know, the tsunami. I love that painting. 
Um, okay. It's actually frost. I got up early in the morning and I was doing some things and the sun started to come up and there was like frost on my windshield. I was like, whoa, just, I, I wish I could, you'd see it with the detail. It's, it's frost, you know, ice crystals are, are yeah. amazing, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, it's like, how do you capture that? I, was, I left it blue. I mean, I could have made it just about any color with that, uh, the way frost is, but that it was just gorgeous you know and i and seeing that light and that quality of light with the with all that other thing going on i thought that was pretty cool hmm. all right well moving right along what quality of light um matching the image to the okay like here, here's this one I, I got i'm still working on it but i did like a cross-country trip and i found this train just sitting in this field in uh upstate new york no tracks uh it had it had about 10 feet of tracks in front of it and behind it it wasn't going anywhere it was a museum <laughs> and uh you know this uh, and, and and so what did you learn while you were photographing it? this was a uh, patience because i saw that i saw that at a certain time of day and i saw the clouds were coming at me so i left i went and had lunch came back and i was watching the clouds and they as they drifted into the image right i thought it would be cool to match you know uh match the quality of light it was kind of overcast because the clouds were behind me kind of blocking playing you know playing dodge you know they poke in and out of the sun and it would be too hot you know too much sun and then it would be the soft light and uh, the clouds, those clouds behind it were still coming behind the train. And there was this kind of cool, cool blue overcast to it. So I, I wasn't going to mess with that. So when the clouds were right about there, you know, making, making this engine, this derelict, not derelict, it's like a museum engine. It's dated. It doesn't look like a modern, you know, uh, train engine. I think it just, it kind of, it kind of, made the whole image come together using you know uh because it looked it's real bright back behind it but in the foreground and and the light that it was living in was definitely um muted and uh you know softbox stuff uh let's see studio you're talking about studio not necessarily i mean not necessarily you know. but not necessarily studio. I mean, you know. No, well, quality of light. You know, like we were saying, like, here's my, uh, here's my, okay, now, uh, I know you guys are experts, but those two young ladies right there, which one was daylight and which one was studio? Well, was on first Saturday? guess, I would say the one on the left was daylight and the uh, studio photograph was on the right was what I would guess immediately. Yeah, I would too. Well, you guys must be like photographers or something. That's very good. Yeah, but um, <laughs> but I like the idea of you know the Rembrandt lighting, one uh, one uh, one light, one light source, and I like the way it kind of bathed her and painted her form, you know, and enough of it to to get the detail of the leather jacket and her skin tone and putting the shadow underneath her chin to make her face come forward in space. And, uh... But you gave us a clue because you had a graffitied wall before. Well, I could have... Uh, did I show you? Yeah, I sure did. I got a thing for street shots and graffiti and everything. Dang it, I gave it away. All right, last time I do that. Okay. <laughs> um, but, uh, the... <laughs> The, no, but I mean, I mean, I mean, there's something, there's something about graffiti that, like, you're drawn to in terms of where you are, photograph. I mean, in the photographs that you're showing, there's yeah. something about the graffiti that resonates for you. I mean, you know, what what is it about graffiti that's, you know, because in order to photograph graffiti, you know, you can't have well, you can, but in your case, you're not you're not letting shadows from buildings fall on the graffiti. You're not yeah. obscuring the graffiti with, with, with fire hydrants. You're, you know, you're making a point to, to show the graffiti as a integral part of your scene. So, yeah. you know, 
Yeah, well, I mean, it's uh, I, personally, you know, growing up in New York, you know, back in the day where they were painting, you know, the sides of subway trains and then to happen to be, you know, near an elevated station and this right. moving art kind of flows by and you're like, whoa, you know, it's 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 underestimated. They've gotten more, you know, cred as it went along. But uh, I've always had a thing for street art, you know, and street photography. And uh, that's probably an extension of that. Um, and I've always been kind of attracted to it. It's a lot. It's a lot. A lot of work goes into it, you know. And I've always, I really, have always enjoyed, you know, graffiti art. And uh, it demands, you know, the colors are bright, the light quality hitting it has to be, you know, punchy, and strong, and everything. So that's that. But uh, okay, when uh, as far as like outdoor. And um, there's one shot that I really like that, that keeps haunting me. There, I, I'll go away from it, I'll come back. But thematically, um, it's always been a shot that uh, shot that has spoken to me and it said a lot to me about um, quality of light, uh, concepts, and uh, this picture here. It's always been one of my favorites. That, uh, now, is is that is that the same guy in uh, reversed graphically and then placed somewhere else, or is that a different person that that you've cut out, or how how did you get those two figures in that space in that way? There was actually ghosts. And I captured with my spectral spectral camera. You they they called you. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay, you got me. It was a Photoshop, but the idea when I started, you know, it was a foggy day, very foggy. It was great. I love to I love to photograph in fog because it does different stuff, you know. But uh, as I was walking along this path, I he was they actually walking on. The lower road and there was a road going up and i was like why you know thematically all these things started going in my head you know because it's like there's like he's going to the future unknown into this uncertain whatever in the distance and uh i was like well what if he was on on the high road going to the high road you know things going on in my life and i'm like oh my god why am i here but i had my camera with me because i kept my camera with me. Huh. and um Yes, it, it is the same guy, and I cut him out in Photoshop and uh, made this photo illustration to really just speak to what was going on in my head, and I moved him from the lower road and put him on the high road, but I just thought it was interesting that in addition to being on the low road, it was this white shape, and uh, you could see some detail in him, but I, I in while I had him... Uh, lassoed out, I darkened him so that he would be a silhouette or just a dark form. And I put him on the road going up. Mm -hmm. And uh, sorry about it. it huh? No, no, go ahead. No, no, no. Uh, it was just, it just spoke to me from where I was in, in that time of life in my life. And, uh, you know, choices of roads that you have to travel. And, uh, yeah, that I answered your question, right? You said if it was the same person, right? Well, I was wondering because you know, there's one guy who looks transcendent. You know, he he's like he's, uh, you know, he's 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 in a different spectral plane as well as in a different plane in the photograph. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. It 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 was it was all of that. You know, the, the, the and and it, I, I was like, wait a minute, why? Why is there a bench on the low road? Why would you want to wait there? You know, thematically, you know, it's like if you're having hard times, you can sit and stay a while. And I was like, wait a minute, this, why would they, <laughs> if you're on your way up, it's going to take work. You know, that's what I was saying. And then there's structure. Can, can we see that image there. again? So can sure, we see, sure, while, you're, while you're talking? That's um, right. No, it's over why. Yeah. Right. You know, there's a bench on the road. Oh, is it? Yeah, there it is. There's a bench on the lower road you know all the wild growth and such and uh on the road going up there's lights there's lampposts there's structures you know there's 
is a different kind of life, you know? And I always thought that was kind of interesting thematically. You know, it, it, you know, once you start, you know, seeing a theme, like you were picking out the, the theme in Kim's work, it's like everything you see kind of feeds into that theme. So that's what I was beginning to see. Do you guys see anything else? Or? Well, just that you have those two images together is kind of intriguing in itself. And the one to the yeah. right of the kid jumping and that oh. together. They very much relate to each other. Really? Yeah. In what way? Well, as you have two people in this in your that photo, you have three, but technically the only two people that I think are, are of concern are the shadow of the kid and the kid itself, and so they sort of relate to the frame to the left of it, uh, the kid in the highlight and the dark shadow in the shadow. Uh, so the shadow represents the person on the right, the light one represents the person on the left, and oh. definitely and in, in also the the contrasting and differences in, in qualities of light. And saying that, you know, although we can get black and white in extreme contrast within a, within, a, within a high contrast frame, we can also get black and white within a sort of flat frame as well uh, with misty lighting. So I think that makes an interesting, intriguing uh, juxtaposition. Oh. Okay. Wow. Well, thanks for that. Can I? Uh... I agree. It reminds it. You know, uh, only because I, I I remember a lot of old movies. Uh, it, it reminds me of uh, the character Joker from uh, from uh, Full Metal Jacket, where he has peace sign on on his helmet, and he also has Born to Kill on his helmet. You know, yeah. and not to say that you're you're saying these things in the same extreme, but there's the duality of man. You know, that's what was what he said. It represents the duality of man. You know, so. You know, there's a duality in personalities that you are uh, illustrating in these two particular images. That there's a that there are as we are, and then there's also this shadow realm that is uh, chock full of energy that you are uh, illustrating. Uh, in these photographs, in the, in the case with the little boy, as Ken mentioned, you know, he jumps and the shadow relates to him. But look how the look how the shadow is there. The shadow the shadow exists in his own his own plane. He has his own sense of gravity. He moves his own direction. You know, the little boy may jump from the from the post to the ground, but that that shadow has a life of its own. But it is uh, not a direct reflection but a, a type of reflection that is uh, more in tandem with the living being than it is a reflection of the living being. And, and similarly with the illustration that you've, you know, you create out of Photoshop, you have one that's going up a hill and another one that's going down a hill and the, the white figure on the left of that up the hill, the, the roadway image, that, that figure you know, represents the sort of the shadow persona of that individual climbing uh, determinately up the up the hill. You know. Hmm. Yeah. You know, like you know, see, that's one thing. That's another thing. Like movies and photography. You know, you you show one image to a hundred people and then they see different things. You know, or hundred people see a movie and they see different things. Go ahead. Or you can show one image to a person over the course of ten days and get ten different reactions. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, I didn't I didn't uh, I didn't even see how they were connected to each other. Thematically or you know and then and in two different qualities of life life too you know one the, the the picture of the kid jumping wouldn't exist if it was an overcast day you know so so seeing how the sunlight is essential to make this kid's play play thing you know, you know me and my shadow and, right uh, but the other one is is a foggy day it's a ground cloud day right. and you've got the same dynamic going on you know so there's an attention to illustrate that experience in that photograph that is replicated or, or as say is recurs in the one that's to the right of it. So there's something about that. And to a certain extent, there's that comparison between 
the young lady with the baby carriage. It's a young lady. She's a young mom. And there's something that's comparative to the, 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 the graffiti. And, you know, the graffiti is representative of a sort of a wilder sort of life, more carefree, daring. You know, it's vandalism. It's illegal. But, you know, but moms tend to be very... But, to, but by the time someone's a mother, that, that person tends to be very, very much uh, very grounded, you know. And reserved, in fact, yeah. it, it, there are very few things that are more grounding than just pushing a baby carriage. You know, your, your whole being is about the care of another human being. You've got mm-hmm. a special compartment for this person, you know, and you're, you're walking. You know, there's, there's a lot that's, that's part of that, you know, conveying a child in a, in a carriage that is antithetical to what goes into tagging a wall. Right. Right. Um, that's a fair just, and the things that said, just, just burning in the hood. The, the, the thing says in the, in the upper, you know, in the center behind all of these odd looking creatures. They're, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, who, Frankenstein-ish. You know. You know, you know who who's more representative of 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 what's good in this world than someone's mother taking like oh someone's mother taking care of them. I mean, you know, a variant of that would be a father obviously taking care of a child too. But the the see, but parenting, you know, there's nothing more wholesome in the 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 image than someone seriously parenting. You know, just walking right past the the, oh, the madness semi legible uh you know ex- you know uh excitement that's going on just to the left of her and and that person doesn't seem to be paying it any mind whatsoever they may have looked at it at one point but in your photograph they're just they're doing what they've got to do to take care of that child right right and the, yes, and yes. you know the the road's a little longer ahead of them than it is behind them because the yeah, it's a, it's a fairly young child, so there's a, there's a lot there. Mm-hmm. It's 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 like a you know non idealistic you know scene of you know the Madonna and child you know what is she going through to you know to care for this child you know walking through it's the hood you know, it's just burning in the hood you know the streets are kind of trashy you know a lot of trash on the sidewalks you know. Doesn't look like a place you'd want to be after dark. Yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. The uh, so you're saying the the uh, not the context, but um, like the guy, the road. There's a lot of thematic things that uh, that are going on. Yeah, when you when you photograph figures intentionally rather than the. Uh, the landscapes where the figures tend to not be there of your design as much, but when you're intentionally placing figures in the frame, there's uh, there's a thematic uh, uh, thread that tends to do that tends to, to to that tends to be about the duality of of, of our existence. And I have to apologize to you guys. I, I think my battery's starting to run out on me a little bit. Okay. I think we've covered quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah, in essence, let's be aware of it because uh, we're, we're just over running into an hour and ten minutes on the conversation. So No way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, All right, so I'm going to go. Hope. Well, I think we okay. should go. Uh, yeah, it looks like uh, we're an hour and 15, or hour 14. Okay. Yeah, we gotta get a we gotta get a timer or something. Yeah, yeah. right. So, yeah. Set your timer for all three of us so we can figure it out. But I, <laughs> I think I think we did good. So. Yep. Okay. I will. Uh, we'll end the recording. Yeah.